Folks, it is good to see you in God's house today. We welcome you in the Savior's name. And if you're visiting with us, we give you a very warm welcome. And those that are tuning into our service, we'd like to welcome you as well. Let us all unite our hearts together in prayer as we come to pray. Just now we want to sympathize with families, again, out of our congregation who have lost loved ones. Our brother, Mr. Robert Higgs, sister, passed away just this week. Uh, And, of course, that's an aunt to Jeffrey and Ronald. We want to sympathize with the entire Higgs family, and we want to assure them of our prayers even in these days. So let's remember the family as we open in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank Thee and praise Thee again, Lord, for this lovely hymn that we've been singing. We thank Thee that, Lord, the day will come when we will leave this scene of time, go go home to heaven, those of us who are saved, and we will see our Savior face to face. Lord, what a glorious day that's going to be. We thank Thee, Lord, for the blessed hope that the child of God has. We're reminded of what Paul said, absent from the body, present with the Lord. And we thank Thee, Lord, and we praise Thee that there is a wondrous place beyond the grave called heaven for the child of God. Oh God, we just pray today that each and every one of us will be possessors of eternal life, that all will be in Christ, redeemed by the precious blood. Do remember the Hig family today, Lord. We pray for them. We ask the Lord that you would comfort them in their loss. Oh God, again, we're reminded of the brevity of our lives upon this scene of time. Oh God, we just pray for those that are bereaved, that they might know the very nearness of the Lord with them this day. We thank Thee, Lord, for each head bowed in Your presence. We thank Thee for each family that's represented here in the church. We pray, Lord, that You'll come and meet with us as we worship Thee this Lord's day. We thank Thee for another Lord's day. We can truly say this is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And, O God, we do rejoice and we are glad. We thank Thee, Lord, for the health and strength that You've blessed us with to be able to be here today to worship Thee. Remember the elderly in our congregation. Remember the shut-ins. Remember those, Lord, who used to come, but, Lord, they're not able anymore. We pray, Lord, that You'll minister unto their needs. And, O God, that they might know the nearness of the Lord with them, even as they would worship this day at home. So, Lord, come and be with us now. We pray for revival. We pray for a moving of God, the Holy Spirit, in our midst. We pray, Lord, that you would come and draw us closer to thyself. And, Lord, we pray that through thy word this day that you would encourage your saints and strengthen us in our most holy faith. We thank thee, Lord, that in the midst of this old world that we can look up and know that our redemption draweth nigh. So, Lord, undertake for us now. We just commit this service to thee for us in Jesus' precious name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Please turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 21. We want to read some verses at the beginning of this chapter this morning. Genesis chapter 21. And we're going to read, commence our reading at the verse 1. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. Verse 2, For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck? For I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this born woman and her son. For the son of this born woman shall not be her with my son, 
even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. Amen. We'll end our reading at verse 11, knowing the Lord will bless the public reading of His precious Word to all of our hearts today. It is good to see so many in God's house this morning. If you're in the main building here or in the adjoining buildings, we welcome you in the Savior's name. And again, let me say uh, to those who are tuning in, very warm welcome to you as well. And we pray that the Lord again will meet with us around His precious Word. just want to make a few announcements very quickly. Do remember the gospel service tonight at 6.30 p.m. And again, in the will of the Lord, I'll be here to preach the Word of God tonight. Our sister Hannah Simpson will be here to sing in the gospel. If you come that little bit earlier, come along, bring your family and friends with you, uh, and let us pray that the Lord will meet with us. The prayer meeting will be at 6 p.m. Tuesday night, we're having another special communion service. God's people do please remember that at 8 o'clock. If you're saved and love the Lord, the Lord commands us, do this in remembrance of me. So do please remember this special communion service on Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Little Treasures on Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. And then on Friday night, again, the children's meeting uh, at 7 p.m. And also the children's meeting Plus, and it was encouraging to see so many children out again on uh, Friday night. Continue to pray for this work. And again, let me just emphasize, if you can help uh, to sit with the children, come along on a Friday night, then you see Margaret and Philip, and they'll put you on to the, uh, the, the schedule. Youth Fellowship, Friday night at 8 p.m. Young people, remember your meeting. Then next Lord's Day, at the Sunday school and Bible classes at 1030 the morning service at 11.30, and I'll be here next Sunday morning. The Reverend Trevor Baxter will be preaching next Sunday night at 6.30 p.m. I have to go to another meeting to take part in that service. The Walker Sisters will be here, God willing, next Sunday night to sing at the gospel service. A few weeks ago, we drew your attention to the fact that our congregation in Market Hill had called a new minister, Reverend Andrew Patterson, the installation of Mr. Patterson will be on Tuesday, uh, or the 2nd of December, Thursday, the 2nd of December. So do please remember to pray for the Patterson family. And I know if you're able to go that evening, you'll be made very, very welcome. That's the installation in Market Hill, uh, Thursday, the 2nd of December. And also, our brother, Mr. Philip uh, Barry, who's been brought up in the church here, went through our Bible college. Philip has got a call to... Uh, the Lisburn Congregational Church, and his installation will be this Friday night at 8 p.m. So do please pray for Philip as well and his family, that the Lord will bless them as they start their ministry there. And again, I'm sure if you go there Friday night, you'll be made very welcome at that installation uh, service. I think that's all the announcements I'm going to make at this stage. On the way out of the church today, there's a little booklet, the paper pulpit, uh, it's volume 3 by the Reverend David Macmillan, and they're three pounds each, so if you want one of these little books, they're just a collection of uh, uh, sermons, uh, short sermons. Please take one and put your name down on the sheet as you leave. Let's bow in a wee word of prayer and ask the Lord for His help as we come now to consider God's Word. Let us all pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we thank Thee again for this privilege which is ours of opening up the Word of God and preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ. And Lord, our prayer is today that you would come and speak to all of our hearts. And O oh God, that we will leave God's house today, saying it was good to be here, for it was here where we met afresh with the Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would close us in with yourself, that you would defeat the old devil. And O oh God, that we might hear the still, small voice of God speaking to us, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it. So, Lord, we just commit the preaching to Thee, for it's in Jesus' precious name we ask it. Amen. Please turn again to that portion of Scripture that we read earlier, Genesis and the chapter 21. Today I want to commence a short series of messages on the life of Isaac. Isaac, of course, was the son of Abraham, and he was the father of Jacob. 
Isaac lived until he was 180 years of age. And his name is recorded in Hebrews chapter 11 as one of the great heroes of faith. Although Isaac is not as popular a character among Bible teachers as Abraham and Jacob, he is still one of the great patriarchs in Jewish history and in the biblical record. And as we're going to find out in the course of these studies, there are many aspects of Isaac's life that point us to Christ. And that is so important. And we're going to find that truth out even in our study this morning. Very simply today, as an introductory message, I want to draw your attention to the birth of Isaac. That's what we have here in Genesis chapter 21. We have here recorded the birth of Isaac. Now, the birth of Isaac was one of the most significant and celebrated births ever recorded in the Word of God. I wonder, did you know that? Next to the birth of Christ and the birth of John the Baptist, Isaac's birth was of the utmost importance because it was through the descendants of Isaac that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, came into the world. Therefore, the significance of Isaac being born was of divine importance. You see, Isaac's birth was the plan and the purpose of God. Isaac was going to be blessed of God, and he was going to be used of God. And we're going to see this in these studies. Now, as we come to consider very simply at the close of our meeting today, the birth of Isaac, there's four things that I want to draw your attention to. And I pray that God will take His Word and write His Word upon our hearts and upon our souls. First of all, I want you to notice that Isaac's birth was promised. It was a promised birth. Years before Isaac was born, God promised Abraham and Sarah that they were going to have a son and that his name would be Isaac. Indeed, on at least three separate occasions before Isaac was born, God promised the parents of Isaac that they were going to give birth to a son. Now, just turn over in the book of Genesis a few chapters. First of all, to Genesis chapter 15. And here we have one of these promises concerning the birth of Isaac. Look at verse 3 of Genesis chapter 15. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord, here's the promise, came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. So there we have one of the promises that God gave to Abraham and Sarah concerning Isaac, the birth of Isaac, long before Isaac was born. Take a look at Genesis chapter 17 there. Look at verse 19. Here's another promise. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. Not only does God promise Abraham and Sarah here that they are going to have a son, but, they, but he reveals to them the name of their son. They would call his name Isaac. Then take a look at Genesis chapter 18 and verse 10. Here's another of these promises that God gave to Abraham and Sarah concerning the birth of a son. And he said, verse 10 of Genesis 18, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life, and lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. So we can see there time and time again before Isaac was born, that the Lord promised Isaac's parents that they were going to have a son. Here we have God promising Abraham this wonderful promise, giving Abraham this wonderful promise. And of course, God kept His Word, and Isaac was born. Take a look at chapter 21, the chapter that we have read together. And look at verses 1 and 2. Here we have these promises being fulfilled. 
And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. Child of God, what do we learn here? Well, we learn this very simple truth. And although it's a very simple truth, it's a very wonderful truth. And it's a truth that you and I who are saved, we should never forget. Now, it's easy to forget this truth, especially when your back's against the wall and especially when things are not going well in your Christian life. It's easy to forget this truth. What is the truth? The truth is this, that God always keeps His promises. That's the simple truth that we learn here. We learn that God always keeps His Word, that His promises are sure and dependable. God always fulfills what He says in His precious truth. God's Word always comes to pass. Matthew Henry, the great commentator, said regarding the fulfilling of these predictions about Isaac, he said this, and I quote, "'No word of God shall fall to the ground, for He is faithful who has promised, and God's faithfulness is the stay and support of His people's faith.'" And it's not a truthful statement. Praise God today, we're gathered in God's house. Our faith, what is our faith in? Our faith is in the Word of God. Our faith is in the promises of God. When we even think of our own salvation, hasn't the Lord promised to give us everlasting life? The promise is, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a promise from God. Whosoever shall believe in the Lord Jesus Christ shall have everlasting life. And there are so many promises in the Word of God just in connection with our eternal and everlasting salvation. And thank God today as we're gathered in the house of God, maybe we have come in today with a burden. Maybe you've come in today with a heavy heart. And maybe your faith is beginning to wane. Oh, dear child of God, turn again to the wonderful promises of the Bible, the promises of God's truth. The Lord has given to us everlasting life, and we shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck us out of his hand. But thank God, all the promises in the Word of God, all the promises to God's people are sure, and they're steadfast. Keep your hand in Genesis 21 for a moment, and underline in your Bible 2 Corinthians 1 and the verse 20. A familiar text, I'm sure, to most of us. But let us not forget what Paul says here as he writes to God's people in the church at Corinth. He says this, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20, For all the promises of God, not just some of them, but all the promises of God, in Him are yea, and in Him amen, unto the glory of God by us. Thank God as we leave God's house today, we can leave God's house with this assurance, dear child of God, that every promise in God's Word, God will fulfill. And especially those promises in regard to you and I as far as the great eternity is concerned. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful that you and I can put our head in the pillow at night and go to sleep with the peace of God in our hearts, knowing that we have a home in heaven, knowing that our sins are forgiven, knowing that heaven is our eternal rest. Child of God, when God makes a promise, He keeps it. That's what we learn here from the birth of Isaac. It was a promised birth, so it was a promised birth. But look at something else. Turn again to Genesis chapter 21, and you'll see, secondly, that Isaac's birth was a miracle. It was a miracle birth. The birth of Isaac was a miracle birth. Everything about Isaac's birth from the conception to the actual birth of the child required divine intervention. Now, it's important that you see that. 
Abraham was a hundred years of age when Isaac was born. Sarah was well past the age of childbearing. Indeed, continually as we read the events of Isaac's birth, our attention is drawn to the age of Abraham and Sarah. Look at verse 2 of Genesis 21. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age. Underline it. In his old age. Look at verse 5. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. Look at verse 7. And she said, Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck? For I have borne him a child in his old age. It was humanly impossible for Abraham and Sarah to have children because of their age. Now, it's important that you see that and that you understand that. So God performed a miracle to bring Isaac into the world. That's what the Scriptures teach us. The miraculous birth of Isaac reminds us, and here's, here's the truth that I want you to see today. The miraculous birth of Isaac reminds us of what? What does it remind us of? It reminds us of the new birth. It reminds us of the new, every new birth, every one that is born again of the Spirit of God is a miracle. It's a miracle. Every conversion is a miracle. Every time a soul is saved, a miracle takes place. Every time a soul is converted, the power of God is demonstrated. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ said to Nicodemus, ye must be born again. But he was emphasizing to Nicodemus that the new birth was the work of of God. The new birth was the intervention of God in the life of the sinner. Remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus, the wind bloweth where it listeth, now hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh or whether it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Oh, dear child of God, today rejoice in this fact that you're among the redeemed of God, and rejoice in the fact that you have experienced the new birth, not because of who you are, but because of the power of God to reach down and save your precious, never-dying soul, to save my never-dying, precious, precious soul. Isn't it a miracle that we are found in the house of God today, saved and redeemed, not only for time, but for all of eternity? Oh, I pray today that the Lord will come and teach us the blessing of what He has bestowed upon us in salvation and in His wonderful and eternal redemption. But there's something else I want you to notice. Turn back again to Genesis chapter 21, and you'll notice something else about this birth of Isaac. You'll notice, thirdly, that Isaac's birth brought great joy. Now, I wonder, did you notice that as you were reading down this passage of Scripture? Abraham and Sarah rejoiced when their son was born. Take a look there at verse 6 and 7, and you'll read these words. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh. Look at verse 7. And she said, Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck, for I have borne him a son in his old age. Look at verse 8. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast. He's rejoicing. He made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. Now, Sarah's rejoicing over having a child is not difficult to understand. When Sarah is first mentioned in the Bible, we are told that she could not have children, that she was barren. Indeed, Genesis 11 and verse 30 reveals that truth uh, to us, and you should take the time to underline that text in your Bible. All her life, 
She went childless until Isaac was born. But what great rejoicing filled her heart the day that Isaac was born. You know, in normal circumstances, she would have rejoiced. But in these circumstances, she would have rejoiced even more. It's hard for you and I to imagine the joy that filled Sarah's heart when she conceived and when she gave birth to Isaac. It's hard for us to fully comprehend the joy that would have filled Abraham's soul when Sarah gave birth to his son. And yet, the Bible tells us here that as soon as Isaac was born, that there was great rejoicing in the home. But notice also that not only was there rejoicing in the home of Abraham and Sarah, but Sarah, or we notice also that there was great rejoicing in the community when Isaac was born. Take a look again at verse 6. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all, underline that, so that all that hear will laugh with me. In other words, all that hear will rejoice in what has happened to me and to Abraham. You know, there's always great rejoicing in a family and in a community when a child is born. And it was no different when Isaac was born into Abraham's family. I can just hear the gossipers, and they're spreading the news. Did you hear the news about Abraham and Sarah? He's a hundred, and she's not far off it either. And they've given birth in their old age. My, can you hear the chitter-chatter throughout the community? Can you hear the rejoicing in the family circle and the wider, wider community when this child, when this miraculous birth takes place? There was great rejoicing. But I want you to notice something else just before we go on. I want you to notice, I wonder did you notice it in chapter 21? I want you to take a look at verse 9. I want you to notice, fourthly, that Isaac's birth was made light of. It was made light of. All in Abraham's home did not rejoice in the birth of Isaac. Look what it says in verse 9. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking Ishmael mocked Isaac. That's what verse 9 is teaching us there. Now, that word mock here in the verse is in the continual tense. I want you to understand that because it's very important to understand this mocking of Ishmael. It's in the continuous tense. That means that Ishmael continually was mocking Isaac. In Galatians 4, verse 29, Paul described the mocking of Ishmael as persecution. In other words, Ishmael was persecuting Isaac and continued to persecute him until he was eventually put out of the home. You see, Ishmael was, he was jealous of Isaac. Up until the birth of Isaac, Ishmael was the heir of Abraham to all that Abraham possessed. But now Isaac, because he was God's promised seed, was the heir of Abraham's possessions. And here we have a young man mocking, mocking. You know, when you consider the birth of Isaac, and this is the wonderful truth, I believe, that is brought out here in the birth of Isaac. When you study the birth of Isaac, you discover that the birth of Isaac is a wonderful type and picture of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I wonder, did you ever consider that? I'm sure you have read and studied the, the, the birth of Isaac and the life of Isaac many, many times. But do you ever consider that his birth is a type and a picture of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You see, we can see Christ 
in Isaac's birth. Like Isaac's birth, the birth of Christ was foretold and promised long before the event. It's not right. We read in Luke 1 verse 30, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And of course, that was the message of the angel to Mary before, before the birth of Christ before the Lord Jesus was even conceived in her womb. And of course, we know that in the prophecy of Isaiah and many other prophecies in the Old Testament, the birth of the Messiah was prophesied hundreds, indeed thousands of years before the Lord Jesus was born in Bethlehem's manger. Indeed, the first promise of the Savior is recorded in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. So in this sense, the birth of Isaac typifies the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Also, like Isaac's birth, the birth of Christ, of course, was a miracle. And we read in Isaiah 7, verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And of course, we know that Christ was virgin-born and the birth of the Lord Jesus coming into this world was a miracle, the miracle of the virgin birth. So again, the birth of Isaac typifies or draws our attention. There is a picture of the birth of the Savior. Also, like Isaac's birth, the birth of Christ brought great joy. You'll remember what is said of the angel in Luke chapter 2, verse 10, and down to 14, we read these words, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. So again, you can see there how the birth of Isaac draws our attention to the birth of the Lord Jesus. Christ's birth was promised many, many centuries before he was born. It was a miracle birth, the birth, the miracle of the virgin birth. And when the Savior was born, there was great rejoicing, not only in the family, not only on earth, but also in heaven when the angels rejoiced over the birth of the Lord Jesus, the blessed Son of God, but also like Isaac's birth, the birth of Christ was rejected by many and scorned by many. You remember what is said in John 1 and verse 10, He was in the world, speaking of Christ, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. So, when we read Genesis chapter 22, and child of God, this is very important because no matter where you read in the Bible, even in the Old Testament, you should always be looking for Christ because the Lord Jesus is seen in all of the Scriptures. And even in these Old Testament patriarchs, not only in Isaac, but in all of these Old Testament patriarchs and in the Old Testament prophets and preachers, we can see types and pictures of the Son of God. And it's so important when we read the Old Testament that we look and we search for the Savior, that we see Christ. And here in the birth of Isaac, the birth of this child, we can see a wonderful and a glorious type and picture of the birth of our blessed Savior, the Lord Jesus, the Son of of God. In the story of Isaac's birth, it points us to the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. My friend, let me just stop there for a moment, and let me, let me ask you today, if you're found in the meeting or listening on, and you're not saved, let me ask you this question. What does, what does the Bible mean to you? What, 
when you read the Word of God, and I'm sure there are many in this congregation, and you're not saved, and I'm sure you read your Bible. When you read your Bible, what does the stories, even in the Old Testament, mean to you? Do you see Christ? Do you see your need of salvation? Do you see the one who died upon the cross for your sins? It's so important as you read the precious Word of God that you just don't read the Bible as a storybook. Many people today, when they read the Bible, they just read the Bible as a storybook. Oh, they believe that the facts in the Bible, as far as the Old Testament history is concerned, they believe that it's true. They believe that there was a man called Abraham and a woman called Sarah, and they believe that they had a son called Isaac. But that's as far as it goes. But my friend, the precious Word of God, it teaches us far, far more than just a history lesson. And that's why it is imperative today, as we study the birth of Isaac and look at this chapter, that We see beyond Abraham and Sarah. We see beyond Isaac. We see beyond the birth of this child. And we see Christ. Because now none but Christ can satisfy. None other name for me. There's love and life and lasting joy Lord Jesus found in thee. And that's why it is imperative for you to realize that this book that we hold in our hands, the book that we call the precious Word of God, the central theme of this book, the central message of this book is Christ and Christ alone. I quoted those words not so long ago in Luke chapter 24 when the Lord Jesus walked with the two on the road to Emmaus and they were sad, and they didn't understand much that happened in those days concerning the Messiah and concerning the Christ of God. They have crucified Him. They have led Him in a tomb. Their hearts were filled with, with sadness. And yet, on that occasion, the Lord, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, declared unto them in all the Scriptures the things concerning Himself. The things concerning Himself. Oh, my friend, the Bible is just not a history book. It's just not a history book. It's a book that teaches us and points us to the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Those of us who are saved understand that. But child of God, as we study the Bible, and especially the Old Testament, make sure you find Christ. Make sure that He is revealed in every story to your heart and to your soul. Look for the Savior. My friend, if you're found in this meeting today, listening on and you're still outside of Christ and knowing nothing of His wonderful and eternal redemption, this book is more than a history book. This book from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, reveals to us the person, the wonderful and glorious person and work of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray today, even at the close of this meeting, even as we come to consider the birth of Isaac, and as we come to look at other aspects of Isaac's life, that as we look at those other aspects of Isaac's life, that we will see the one who this book reveals unto us, Jesus, the blessed and eternal and everlasting Son of God. May God bless these few thoughts and uh, and this introductory message today from the life of Isaac. Let us all bow in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank Thee and we praise Thee for all Thy mercy to us today. We thank Thee, Lord, for saving us and redeeming us for time and for eternity. What a blessing it is to know that we're heaven-bound. And Lord, we thank Thee that even in the book of Genesis, we thank Thee, Lord, in the life of Isaac, 
It draws our attention and points us to the Lamb that was slain upon the cross. O God, how we thank Thee this day for the precious, precious Word of God. We thank Thee, Lord, for our blessed Savior. O God, I pray that in these days, when this world is rushing around, going crazy, Lord, that You would help us as Your own people. Help us, Lord, to get into the Word. And help us, Lord, to study the Word. And as we study it, Lord, help us to find Christ. And as we find Christ, help us, Lord, to rest upon the Savior and to rest upon the promises that the Savior gives in His truth. Oh, God, we, we're thrilled today. We're thrilled to think that on a number of occasions, before Isaac was born, God gave his parents the promise time and time again. And oh God, although Sarah doubted the promise at the beginning, oh God, and she did doubt it. She wouldn't believe it. But oh God, we thank thee that the word of God came to pass. We thank thee, Lord, that thy word always comes to pass. Oh God, I pray for those in our congregation here, and Tandra Gee, perhaps they're going through difficult times in their Christian lives, and their backs are against the wall. Oh God, and perhaps even they're in the depths of despair. Oh God, I pray today that they would turn their eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face, and the things of this earth will go strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. I pray, Lord, today, Lord, for such that would be in God's house, listening to God's Word. And, O oh God, their, their faith, Lord, is beginning to waver. O oh God, I pray that they'll turn afresh to the wonderful promises of the Word of God and the Christ of God, and that they would look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We thank Thee, Lord, that our faith is not in ourselves. It is not in a church. It is not in a minister or a preacher. We thank Thee, Lord, today, and we're so thrilled to know that our faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed, but our faith is firmly fixed upon the Word of God, the precious Word of God, this Word that is incorruptible, this Word that is inspired, this Word that is eternal. O oh God, help us to rest. Help us to rest, whatever our circumstances may be, whatever difficulties we're passing through, help us to rest, Lord. Rest upon the promises of God. And Lord, we'll be very careful to give to Thee the praise, the glory, and every bit of the honor. For it's in Jesus' precious name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Folks, God bless you. Safe home. Remember the meeting tonight. Come out again with your family. God bless.